Greetings, welcome to Learner Burn Studios. In today's video, we're finally going to pour some metal. The shells need to be hot before we can pour metal into them. So we're, we're gonna put them into a preheat. And there's a variety of ways you can preheat. But ultimately, one way or the other, as people typically will preheat their shells, they'll pull them out and then bury them in sand. And the logic behind that is to, you know, if, if there's a leak or if there's a crack, you know, if there's a problem and stuff like that, it keeps the metal contained. I actually disagree with that approach. What I like to do, as you can see here in front of me, is I have a rack and I literally hang my shells completely exposed when I'm pouring the metal. And the reason for this is that, so first step is I do put them into another kiln to kind of preheat them. And then as the metal becomes ready and is the right temperature, I'll bring them out, hang them in this rack, and then as I pour the molds, if there's a leak, if there's a problem I need to deal with, I can see where that leak is and fix it. <laughs> you, you, you can kind of see my logic at it coming at it, is that it's like going, I mean, I don't want to just, if, if this thing starts leaking and it's buried in sand, I can see, and that sand, unless it's completely rammed super tight around it, the metal's still going to leak out. And so suddenly if this is in sand and you got a leak here, or in a crack or something, and you have you know, metal coming out and basically kind of encasing your mold. Well, I don't want to have to waste my metal that way. I mean, there's a lot of extra cleanup. I can make it around and stuff like that, and your castings will certainly survive, more than likely. But, again, it's like going, if, if, if there's going to be a problem, I like to be proactive enough, and I want to you know, get in there and actually fix it. Now, the, one of the other benefits of uh, hanging your shells like this is that it allows the metal to cool evenly through the shell. That's another thing that, you know, we're challenging things when if they're buried in too much sand or even worse, actually only buried halfway in sand, suddenly the top of your mold is cooling faster than the, the part that's encased in sand and you're going to wind up, um, as this metal cools, it's actually going to potentially pull metal from the hotter, hotter points, points. That could be from the cup which is ideally where you want the, that metal to be pulling from, but it also could easily be pulling from your pattern. So if you are gonna, be, if you are gonna bury your, your pieces, bury them in, in its entirety, but again, I feel that it's, you know, for me, and again, it's like going, oh, everything I'm talking about, this is, these are techniques I've developed over 30 years of casting, and this is the way I approach it, and, and everything I do, it, you know, there is a reason, and nothing's random here. But this is what works best for my system, and that's all I'm trying to show you. You'll need to make those decisions on your own, given your foundry setup, you know, whether it's an independent backyard, you know, a little foundry, whether you're in a school, uh, whether, and or whether you're running a small commercial foundry. You know, you'll need to make all these kind of steps and decisions and figure out what's best practice for you. But again, this, this is just, I'm just trying to show you what I do and talk about the reasons and why I've made these, these decisions. So now what I'm going to do is, you know, so I like to kind of test fit, make sure everything fits on the rack um, the way I'm going to pour. And so now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and put these into the preheat kiln. Now there are a variety of ways you can preheat your shells, whether that be in a, a, you know, an electric kiln, a coffin kiln. You can actually just jam a weed burner on it. Um, you can, you know, in my case, I'm actually going to use my burnout kiln for my preheat. But one way or the other, you do need to bring up the temperature of your shells. If you pour molten metal into a cold shell, moisture is going to condense inside that shell, and that moisture is going to turn to steam, and it's going to blow your shell apart. Or, or maybe not, a, you know, like a stick of dynamite blow it apart and stuff like that, but it's definitely going to crack your shell, and it's, your, your casting is going to fail. So you want to bring your shells up in the temperature. The minimum temperature is around 400 degrees, 500 degrees. And this is at a point where, you know, things can bust, but it also really makes sure that, you know, no moisture is left in your shells. Now, in my situation with, with my kiln, what I like to do, since I'm going to pull them out and hang them in a rack, I bring my shells typically up to about 14, 1500 degrees, but with the expectation that by the time I get them out on the rack and I get my metal ready to pour, the shells are going to be more like 1000 degrees. If my mold is basically an ingot, you know, something super thick, chunky, you know, minimal detail. The shells really don't need to be much more than about 500 degrees. If I'm pour, on the other hand, if I'm pouring something super thin, some lace, some uh, uh, paper thin, 
uh, some things, you know, crazy detail, fabrics, whatever, then I might actually heat my shells up to more like 2,000 degrees. Metal doesn't even have a chance to, you know, cool down from hitting a cooler shell. But we can get in, we can talk more about those techniques in a future video. So however you're going to heat your shells, go ahead and get them all prepped up. Get that situation, you know, taken care of and even potentially lit. Depending on the furnace, you'll need to gauge how long that's going to take. If you're in an electric kiln, you might well have to put your shells into a kiln an hour before you actually light up, light up your metal. Obviously with K-Wool kilns, you get a little bit you know, faster return for your, you know, your heat. Or if you're actually jamming a, a heat source directly on the shells, you might even get a, be able to heat them up a little bit faster. But for the most part, my furnace here will, will come up with the temperature. When I'm pouring aluminum, it'll, I can get a pot of metal in a little under a half an hour. And so I, I'm actually hard pressed to get my shells hot enough that quickly and stuff. So a lot of times if I'm pouring aluminum, I'll get my preheat going you know, a little on the early side. If I'm pouring bronze, it's gonna take me closer to an hour before I get a full pot of metal. And at which point I can get away with lighting my furnace a little bit in. So again, you're just gonna to need to, you know, test your equipment, kind of get a feel for it. And, it, you know, um, and each rig, each setup is gonna be a little bit different. So I'm going to go ahead and set these in, cup down, make sure no debris falls into them. And I can place them in. So I have my burner port here, so I want the flame to come in and still be able to heat evenly. I don't want to put something right in front of it that will necessarily block the heat, and, and so my shells are uneven. I want to have all the shells um, at an even temperature. We want to remember that one of the key things about casting in shell, one of the really big perks, is opposed to pouring in the sand, which is a cold material, so you need thicker gates, thicker patterns to accommodate um, the reduction of or the cooling of temperatures of your metal as it impacts that cooler material for your investments. With the ceramic shell being preheated, we have little to no heat loss, and so the metal stays fluid a lot longer and allows us to get much more detailed patterns, undercuts, um, and as well as uh, thinner thicknesses in our overall metal. In the furnace, I can go ahead and get this lit and shut the door, and we'll allow that to preheat while we're melting the metal. So for the pour, I'm going to have some basic equipment that I'm going to use to facilitate the handling of the crucible, as well as uh, manipulating the metal, checking it for consistencies, and when it's ultimately ready for temperature. The, the first piece of equipment is the uh, ingot tongs, and they're, they're literally just that. This is what I'm going to use to grab a hold of the ingots or pour cups or additional metal to feed into the furnace. We have a skimmer. There's a variety of different designs and approaches, you know, for this. Um, I like the kind of hemisphere uh, scraper. It allows me to kind of, you know, clean up, you know, it's, it's similar in diameter to the actual crucible. It allows me to keep it a little bit cleaner. Ultimately, a, a pyrometer. Um, the pyrometer is a luxury, um, and, and it's nice for con super consistencies, but there are some other tricks that we'll talk about uh, for checking the temperature of the metal. Um, and then as well as um, this new rig I got from uh, Lloyd at Chicago Crucible. It's his new design that he came up with for a, a, basically a solo pouring tongs. And this will replace the traditional uh, pouring shank and crucible tongs. And I look forward to showing those to you. Links for Lloyd's contact information will be in the description. And so, and then of course we have the furnace. We have our pour pit, rack, preheat slash burnouts outside. Now, even though I'm going to melt the right amount of metal, I'm always going to have, you know, like I said, I'm always going to add just a little bit more on the off chance that there's, you know, oddities. So at the end of the pour, whatever metal's left, ideally you want to empty out of the crucible. It'll uh, lengthen the life of the crucible if you, if you don't have metal uh, cooling down in it. So you want to have, you know, whatever your ingot molds are already set up and ready to go to pour excess metal into it. Now these are you know, heavy cast iron ingot molds, but whether your ingot molds are, are out of cast iron or whether they're fabricated out of angle iron or uh, muffin tins or whatever you're, you're gonna use, you do wanna make sure that those are preheated. So I'm just gonna you know, tuck my ingots under the furnace just a little bit. If hot metal hits cold metal, it's gonna splash and potentially quite violently. So we wanna make sure we preheat our ingot molds and drive off any additional moisture 
surface moisture and whatnot. So when the metal hits, it flows into the ingot mold smoothly and in a very controlled manner. First come over to the propane tank. Make sure my main valve at the furnace is off. And off meaning that I'm using quarter valves. So I want, I want the valve to be perpendicular to the main flow of gas, indicating that it's in an off position. So that's indeed off. I'm going to turn on the tank of gas. I'm going to raise the uh, pressure in it. Now I've found that my furnace will run pretty well at about eight pounds. I can get away with less if I have a single burner, but this furnace design is utilizing a double burner. So I need just a little bit more pressure but eight pounds seems to do it. So as far as lighting it goes, the things I want to be mindful of is that one, I always want to have the furnace lid open. You never want to light a kiln or a furnace with the lid or door closed. If the gas fills up too much before you ignite it, you're going to blow the lid off or just create problems both for yourself and for your equipment. Okay. So I got some paper, I could use cardboard. I'm going to twist it up so it'll burn a little slower. Go ahead and get this lit. I'm going to go ahead and just stick this down here. Turn on the air. Slowly add the gas. Now that I have flame ignition, I'm going to start adding a little more air. Now right now my valves are roughly both at 45 degrees. It's pretty, you know, kind of an even mixture. I'm gonna let that run as is for a few for a minute or two and, and start to preheat. And then I'll close the lid and then I'll start ramping up the temperature and the carburation of the furnace. Ultimately what we're looking for as we're finding that ratio of gas and air is ultimately it's the carburation. And a lot of times you'll be able to tell you know, your ideal carburation more by sound than by sight. And so initially I'm going to you know, start with kind of an even amount of gas and air. And an even amount is kind of arbitrary, but in my situation I'm using quarter valves to control both my air and my gas. And so I'm going to leave them both at about 45 degrees and I found that this you know, gives me just kind of a nice kind of general balanced mix or neutral mix. As the temperature starts coming up, that ratio is going to change, whereas you know, it's reasonably even initially. As it gets hotter, I'm going to need less gas but more air. There are some visual clues that we can you know, use. And so what we're going to do is like, if we can get down low enough and look just across the top of the lid of the furnace, if there's no flame coming out, more than likely, it's, it's what we'll refer to as an oxidizing flame. There is more air than there is gas. If we wind up having you know, or way too much flame coming out, and, you know, and whether that's you know, blue or orange, or if you've been firing your furnace a lot with bronze, a lot of times these flames will be green. If you wind up having five or six inches of flame coming off the top of your furnace, then that's a reduction flame. You have too much gas as opposed to your air. Really what we're looking forward to is just a little bit of, uh, of flame, just a little bit of a flicker and some of that, and that's usually a nice indication of a neutral flame. These characteristics are the same in whether you're you know, lighting the furnace, whether you're lighting an oxyacetylene torch, all these kind of carburations all have a similar relationship and, and the same visual clues. One of the things we need to be you know, careful of is that you never want to introduce cold metal into the liquid metal. If you put cold metal into a hot furnace, the moisture is going to condense on the metal and then ultimately will turn to steam. If the steam occurs as it's hitting the molten metal, it can literally splash and throw molten metal back out of the furnace. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we preheat anything that come, that's going to come in contact with the molten metal. And that includes you know, your skimmers and tongs and whatnot. But it, specifically in this case, we want to be able to preheat our metal. So to add additional metal, to the, to the hot crucible, you're going to use your ingot tongs 
and you can go ahead and grab the ingots and or pour cups, sprues, gates, whatever else you're, you're, you want to melt down. As you grab them and hold them over the opening, go ahead and hesitate just for you know, five or 10 seconds just to make sure that any moisture on them is going to go, be driven off and then go ahead and set it down. Now you don't want to drop things. Obviously you want to you know, be careful placing that metal into, you know, into the right spot until it's situated. And then you can wait and let that metal you know, melt down and introduce itself into the pot before adding in some additional metal. It's, it's easy to forget to put your safety gear on sometimes. So realistically, once you know you have molten metal, you should be wearing your leathers. You don't want to be wearing synthetics. You want to be wearing cotton clothing. And I, you want to wear a barrier, of, you know, um, I like to wear leather, but you can also use the, these aluminized suits. And so you want, but you need some, some sort of barrier that can handle uh, a certain amount of, of splashing metal if you get impacted by that. And whether that's from a mold blowing up or throwing cold metal into your furnace, but also to help protect you from the heat. Another thing you want to be careful of is you want to be able to, you want to take out any metal, coins, keys, anything that's in your pockets because even behind leather and stuff like that, those objects will uh, absorb radiant heat from the furnace and will burn you right through your clothing. But to ultimately to verify what the temperature is, I am going to use a submersible pyrometer. Now the best way to get the temperature is that the one thing you don't, you don't want to do is you don't want to just stick it in, stir it around, and wait for it to heat up the pyrometer and stuff like that. You'll wind up burning out your thermocouple that way. So what you want to do is go ahead and stick just the, the tip of the thermocouple inside the lid and watch, your, watch the meter, and you want to preheat it to higher than what you think your temperature wants to be. So in this case, we're shooting for 2150 for our pour temp. So I'm going to preheat this until about 2200 degrees. Once I have it up to the 2200 degree mark, then I'm going to go ahead and submerge it into the, into the metal a few inches, give it a quite, just a little bit of a stir. But basically what I'm doing is I'm letting the metal actually cool down the thermocouple and that will give me a much more accurate read. From all the kind of my visual clues, the, the color of the furnace, you know, it's that you know, super bright orange, almost to a yellowish to a white. I know from experience that that's you know, roughly about the 2100 degree mark. So another good indicator is, um, you know, as I'm looking into the furnace, I can see that the glass from the crucible is starting to flux and into the release and froth a little bit. So it's releasing into the, into the metal, creating the dross and pulling out the impurities. I'm going to shut the furnace down. I'm going to do that by hitting the gas first and then the air. And then I'm going to pull out my shells. Turn off the gas. Not going to worry about the blower. So the shells, the parameter red about 1500 degrees, so that gives a little time to get in here and hang these things up. I do, obviously you want to do this fairly quickly. Don't have quite the headroom with the GoPro on my head that I'm used to. Okay, change gloves.
set this here. I'm gonna grab the skimmer really quick. Put on the lockdown, the two part process. Put this on. Still getting used to the logistics of the rig. Okay, so I'll pull back my lockdowns. What I want to do is I want to get the metal just up to the lip, line it up before committing to the pour. And I'm not going to fill up my cups all the way first. Once I do commit, I'm going to, I want to have a nice healthy stream. I don't want to just trickle it in. I want to get some nice compression to force that metal into the details that I want. Whoop, got some leakage there. We'll see if that freezes off. It looks like the leak is in the sprue, or the gate, I mean. That came up through the vent. Come up for this last pour. Okay, I'm gonna. So it does look like that froze off enough, so maybe I can get in top off this cup. A lot of times I'll short my cups a little bit just to make sure I have enough metal, which I did on that first pot. Whoops, got a little sloppy here at the end, but not too bad. Okay. And in looking at the crucible, I have maybe like two pounds of metal left. So my weighing came out just dead on. I am gonna go ahead and pull out a crucible here though, or ingot mold, I mean. I mean, with that little bit of metal, I could easily leave that in the crucible. Pull it back up. Okay, and that'll do it. So the last thing we'll do is we'll put some K-Wool on the tops of these cups, and this is just a I want to keep the cups molten as long as possible, and as the pattern shrinks, it'll actually pull from the cup. Okay, so after a, a quick breakout and a quick sandblast, here's the one of the skulls that we just poured. Came out pretty well. There's a few anomalies and stuff on it, but so it'll give us a chance to talk about chasing and one of the next videos, um, as well as actually how to, some proper techniques for de-investment, breaking off the shell, getting out the core, things we want to think about during sandblasting. Um, to remove the shell. And until the next video, be creative and be safe.